Hello and welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Gordon Smith. And this week, I'm joined by Ashab Rizvi from the Skift Research Team to talk all things low-cost, long-haul. Hi, Ashab. How's it going? It's awesome. I've just uh, finished writing this uh, post for the second part of my report, so it's going great. And I've also been told that today is my first anniversary with Skip, which is super awesome, being part of such an amazing organization. So yeah, all good. Double congratulations in store. So uh, your first anniversary and part two of your report. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, Ashab has just completed uh, a quite a beefy report for the uh, Skiff research team looking into uh, the low cost, long haul airline sector. And Ashab, for maybe the 1% of our listeners who aren't quite familiar with what that means for their benefit, in your own words, what, what, what does low cost, long haul mean? Sure. So this is uh, one of the final frontiers of commercial aviation. And uh, this is basically low cost budget airlines venturing into long haul operations per se. So, and this has been a very widely talked about topic. We have seen many airline casualties in this space as well. So there's, there's, there's always this conversation, what strategy or what, what exactly are we, is there a one size fits all strategy that can work for low cost budget airlines to finally venture into long haul? You're absolutely right. It's one of the the hottest topics around at the moment, but it has been really a, a super hot topic for decades, going back to to Freddie Laker and the, the the Sky Train crossing the Atlantic for for budget fares, and even going back to uh, Loftleader, which uh, I think was an Icelandic airline back in the '60s. I think uh, Bill 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 and Hillary Clinton, if I'm uh, correct, they they did some of their hippie trips to Europe back in the day, going via Iceland on on what was one of the pioneers of, of low-cost travel. Um, just for our listeners' benefit, Ashab, it's important to, to define between a low-cost model on short-haul or medium-haul networks, like we see with Southwest and Ryanair, maybe two, three, four hours, and long-haul. What are, what are the challenges that start to creep into the business model when you start to stretch the sector length to seven, eight-plus hours? Sure. Uh, I think... Uh... Yeah, that's that's a fair question, and I think that is what most of the airlines have been trying to uh, get an answer for. So there's a bunch of reasons why uh, and why some of these airlines have been unsuccessful, especially entering into long haul space. And to list down a couple of reasons why this idea and why this hasn't worked until this point, I'll, I'll give you a couple of uh, reasons. One of them is typically LCCs rely on a single class cabin. Uh, on most of their flights, they can try an air easy jet or even Southwest, for example. And for long haul flights, single cabin, single class cabins aren't very optimal. So this this has been uh, this has been, this this has been something that uh, airlines have not been able. I mean, for airlines for LCCs to go out of their way out of their business model to include a multiple class cabin or even try wide body aircrafts is something that is very difficult for them to do and go completely out of their way to do that so that's that's one of the challenges why this hasn't worked uh then we also see uh, in, in my report i also mentioned that the finance cost or the rental cost per flight actually goes up as lccs try a a longer stage length flight so in in, in one of my analysis what i also found was that the finance cost actually increases by 8% as US airlines moved away from domestic to international markets. So again, that is also another component that uh, becomes worrisome for the airline. Uh, airlines, these airlines, these budget-friendly airlines have always relied on their cost effectiveness, their, 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 their model, which is heavily, heavily reliant on making sure that they have very less cost to handle. And for their costs, to go up is again something that becomes very difficult for them to handle. Uh, along with the higher finance cost, our analysis also found out that on transatlantic routes versus compared to domestic routes for US airlines, the percentage of aircraft fuel expenses also goes up by 5%, or by five basis points. So on domestic network, the cost contribution 
uh, of aircraft fuel is roughly about 21% and it goes up to 26% uh, when they go on international routes, specifically on transatlantic routes. So again, that's another component. And fuel, as we all know, is a highly volatile expense for the airline. No matter what they do, they, there is very little control that they have over fuel. And uh, there are a couple of other reasons which are very, very specific to budget airlines as well. And one of them is using regional airports. So legacy airlines, they typically operate from hubs, uh, from JFK or from Boston Logan. But uh, airlines like EasyJet or Ryanair, they would ideally look for a secondary or a regional airport to operate most of their flights. And that is not very optimal for uh, for stimulating business demand and it's largely focused on intercontinental or domestic networks so for long haul flights you would probably need some business demand as well so that you can have higher class cabins and higher prices as well and that again becomes a very challenge a big challenge especially when you're operating out of these smaller regional airports and then finally i guess their reputation for service quality is not that great anybody traveling for eight to nine hours of journey, it's very difficult to convince them to sit in a seat with no IFE, very uh, a very small seat with domestic-like uh, seat with, and that becomes another challenge. Uh, people don't want to travel on long and ultra long haul journey on those seats, so their reputation for service quality also impacts uh, and has historically impacted why they have always felt that instead of venturing into a long haul, it's probably better for us to stay committed to short and medium haul networks. And those were some of the reasons why the there's this challenge with uh, operating and successfully operating and profitably operating a long haul network. Really, really interesting. Lots of themes to unpack there, Ashab. One of them that struck me, uh, having read the report, is the uh, focus on ancillary revenues. So these are the add-ons uh, that yeah. can be incredibly profitable on a short-haul network. So if you're flying from London to Paris, to use a generic example, five, six, eight sectors a day, depending on on, on how short the, the, the sector might be, you have got eight opportunities to get 180 people to buy your sandwiches, to buy your luggage, to buy your allocated seats. If you're then just using that equivalent aircraft for, for one sector or two sectors a day, you've got far less opportunity to, to sell your wares. Is, is that a consideration as well? Absolutely. We've actually talked about that uh, on, on the other part of the report, where we say that if your frequency of flight is lesser because now you're operating a seven eight hour flight so you're basically operating two fl two flights or two legs in a single day your opportunity goes down considerably versus operating between six different cities on a domestic network so and, and then the, one of the expectations on a long haul flight also is to have uh, is I mean, especially if people have been traveling on legacy network airlines for a while now so there is that expectation that they will be offered meals on different intervals and there will be other benefits and services now that is also a big miss because if airline starts charging for every little thing there is that resentment within passengers that they've been doing so on other airlines and it was fairly good and now they have to pay for all of this each and every little service because they basically unbundle all the services and just charge you for a basic seat price so the opportunity lesser opportunities for ancillary like you just pointed out and also having to pay for literally everything on an eight-hour flight becomes very difficult for airlines to manage. You mentioned eight hours there. I think I mentioned eight-hour figure as well, Ashab. I remember flying AirAsia X from London Stansted to Kuala Lumpur on an Airbus A340 uh, in 2009, and I was able to get the fare one way direct uh, Stansted Kuala Lumpur for £99. Back then, which even adjusted for inflation is an incredible fare, and yeah, it, it, it is incredible, completely unsustainable. The the route didn't last very long, especially with a fuel thirsty A three forty in the mix. But what struck me on the uh, so the origin and departure side of things, London's obviously a, a huge draw, as is Kuala Lumpur to a to a lesser extent for for backpackers and for for holiday makers, not to mention VFR. How reliant are airlines, traditional airlines, on feeder traffic for supplying 
you know, getting the bums on seats for these flights. If you don't have the established network, if you're coming in cold as a new entrant, long haul, low cost carrier, you're not going to have the, the network feed. Uh, is, is that an issue as well? Absolutely. It's, it's one of the issues that we've also pointed out in our report that they, that they, they lack the network effects. So if you choose to operate a point-to-point -point model rather than the complex hub and spoke, which traditionally is operated by legacy carriers, I mean, it's a very effective system uh, for a long-haul flight. And you will end up losing. I mean, there is, it's very, diffi very difficult for you to get that feeder traffic uh, if, you, uh, if you've only started along. I mean, and it's probably going to take you a while to get a strong point-to-point -point network demand or demand and 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 that can vary very well but then legacy airlines have this strong network advantage which is very difficult very difficult for legacy lccs to compete with really really interesting stuff and i know in the report you referenced uh some some data from skiff research exploring gen z and millennial travel habits there are a lot of young people who are short for cash, but also want to have these, these lifestyle experiences. Surely there's enough of these people to, 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 to simplify things that are happy to put up with a lousy seat, no or little IFE, a non-existent meal, or maybe a very basic meal. If you're getting a really cheap fare, are there not enough people on these trunk routes to, to support low cost long haul? Why, why, why is it so hard? I mean, actually, there is. So I think this is where we get into the second part of the report, which uh, what we're saying here is that that despite these challenges, this this new emerging middle class and this changing travel preference, especially within young people, that may be one of the drivers for this potential demands that uh, LCCs might see uh, before they venture into long haul. So even if I mean, one of our research survey actually says that a very tiny population, uh, and I'll give you the numbers, we found that only 30%, 31% of millennials in the US uh, and Gen Z were open to flying more than six hours, and uh, just under 22% in the UK and in Germany, this percentage was even lower at 20. But even if that's the case, we're still looking at 44 million passengers just in america and about six million odd passengers in the uk and in germany people of that age who want to travel which is still a very big market uh for lccs to capture so now we are moving from okay there have been historical challenges with this business model but post pandemic and with this new generation and their changing travel preferences is there a real opportunity looks like there is a real opportunity and this is where it is this demographic is going to be the first one that lccs can potentially target because they don't want uh, a three course meal on a set on an eight hour flight they might be fine because they have their own smartphones maybe they don't want the super high tech or the the basic ones at british airways the ife at british airways but so they might as well be fine as long as the airline is giving them a super, super cheap deal on a long haul flight. So much more to discuss, Ashab. Stay with us. Uh, we will take a very short break. In part two, we'll continue our low cost long haul discussion. Don't go anywhere. Hello and welcome back to the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. I'm your host, Gordon Smith, and this week I'm joined by Ashab Rizvi from Skiff's research team, and we are discussing all things low-cost, long-haul. Um, Ashab has just published a report, a two-part report, in fact, um, picking through some of the, the themes, the opportunities, the trends. Part one, we looked at some of the challenges, Ashab. Let's maybe try and put a little bit more of a positive spin on it, if we can, in, in part two. There's new aircraft uh, which were not around 10, 15, 20 years ago. I'm thinking the the, the Dreamliner, I'm looking at the A350, potentially even the, the, the 777X, but also the short, oh, sorry, the uh, single aisle A321 XLR, uh, maybe even the MAX 10. There are new aircraft types coming on, on board, which could potentially make the, the low cost long haul model a little more feasible. Should we be, should we be excited about those? I think perhaps uh, that's, 
arguably the biggest and the most important change that's uh, that is going to lead from the front uh, for the low cost airline business model and this new generation of aircrafts we uh, and i've talked about the a321s in particular and the boeing 737 maxes these can be game changers uh, for especially for unlocking the successful long haul because they offer very high efficiency on their aircraft they offer amazing range now lccs can target leisure passengers which is their traditional market and they can now fly all the way directly to some of the some of the beautiful leisure destinations across the world which was previously not possible because they could not go outside of their business model and taking in wide bodies so that is going to be a very big massive change that is going to lead this evolution and if we look at the transatlantic as a as a flashpoint for low cost long haul currently if you if you want to use a, a loose definition of of low cost we've got JetBlue in there with the 321 LRs uh, we've got North Atlantic Airways flying the the 787s talk, talk us through the, the the comparable business models at play there sure uh, so JetBlue uh, only started their transatlantic service in 2021 and they have been using the A321 years so they stuck with their business model of only flying narrow bodies which doesn't have the complexity of flying wide body aircrafts but we have seen a new breed of airlines like french b and like north atlantic which have specifically used only wide bodies to fly between destinations on especially on uh, essentially offering uh, cheaper tickets on these long haul low cost flights now one of the advantages that jet blue has especially using the a321 neos is that its total operating cost per flight is roughly one third of a Boeing 777. So that gives you a massive advantage, especially in terms of cost. And this cost advantage when allows the airline to offer even lower fares. So that's their typical strategy. When we look at the strategy that was adopted by airlines like French B and North Atlantic, their strategy, uh, while it is very comparable to JetBlue's because North Atlantic also offers a premium cabin, uh, and it also offers, uh, they, they're heavily reliant on making sure that they fill up the aircraft. In the last few years, their load factors have been around 90%, but they haven't been very profitable. I mean, one of my analysis also shows that they, I mean, prior to North Atlantic, we used to have Norwegian, which was also trying to do the same thing using the 787 Dreamliners they were only profitable in three of the seven years uh, before the pandemic. Now the challenge versus, now if I look at JetBlue's financials, they have been very profitable in transatlantic operations. Uh, we were able to get information from US Department of Defense, uh, US Department of Transport, my apologies. And they, uh, airlines are expected to publish uh, financial performances by region. So JetBlue on transatlantic routes had an operating profit margin of nearly 51% in the third quarter of 2023, which is one of the most important quarters for US aviation, US airlines. But North Atlantic, although it's doing fairly well, but hasn't had, hasn't done as incredibly well financially as JetBlue. So that's, that's where there is that difference. It becomes very difficult to manage a wide body because the total operating expenses is very high. Uh, I, while I understand that uh, North was able to get amazing lease agreements in the first place, but uh, it's not going to be very easy for other airlines operating by parties. Yeah, some unique factors influencing North's current setup. And you're absolutely right, Ashab. Um, I was on the first flight from Oslo to JFK a couple of years ago uh, and spoke to Bjorn, the, the airline CEO, uh, and yeah, they got a very, very, very good deal on the yep. Dreamliners yep. secured during the pandemic. And a question that he's often asked uh, in, in more recent months and, and, and even the past year or so is, if you're struggling to make money with these dirt cheap 787s that you got on a basically a fire sale basis during the peak of the pandemic, if, if you're struggling to make the business model work on those terms with such a 
relatively efficient exactly. aircraft on uh, very, very uh, competitive finance terms. What hope has, has anyone else got, never mind themselves, to, to, to make low cost, long haul across the Atlantic work, never mind further afield? Let's just take a look at some of the, the other themes that are developing. You mentioned the rising middle class in many parts of the world, Ashab. People are wanting to, to travel more. And we've seen that with uh, low cost carriers within given countries on a domestic basis. People are looking to, to travel further afield. Were there any particular parts of the world aside from the transatlantic region that are, are sort of hot areas to watch? Absolutely. I mean, Asia Pacific, for instance, is a very big uh, market where we see there's this growing middle class with this unsatiable desire to travel. And you've seen, uh, not just from our surveys, but because I'm based out of this part of the world, the difference in spending habits, the difference in focus, the difference in this desire to travel. What I'm seeing in my generation and what we have seen in generations before, if there's a stark difference here. Indigo, which happens to be one of the biggest low-cost airlines in this part of the world, has actually started flights. Uh, they're not technically long-haul flights, but it has ha it has direct flights into Baku, Azerbaijan. It is also has uh, many flights going to Central Asia, to Tashkent. Now, these are leisure-specific destinations. And uh, given the fact that Indian government was able to secure uh, visa-free entries, uh, both the countries were able to agree on visa-free entries of travels, travelers back and forth. Indigo was the first airline in this part of the world to pounce at that, on that opportunity and announce direct daily flights to these countries. And you will not believe most of these airlines, most of these flights going to these, these parts of the world, going on 90% load factors. And these, are, these, are, these flights to these countries are actually doing so well that Indigo is now thinking that potentially they're potentially looking to start more long haul operations. And there is an active conversation about getting wide bodies so that they can actually travel even further into Europe and into Central Asia. So the, besides the transatlantic market, Mexico, Southeast Asia, some of the some of the most success, one of the most successful long long haul low cost airlines, Air Asia X is actually based in this part of the world. And then you've got Scoot, which is Singapore Airlines's LCC. Again, it has flights all the way from Singapore to hit to Athens, and then there is Indigo, and there are many other airlines here which are doing incredibly well. Fly Dubai, for instance, is another one which is based out of uh, Dubai, sister LCC of the of Emirates. Uh, this part of the world, huge population, almost one third of the of the global population is actually based out of this part of the world, and uh, airlines are the first one to bank on this opportunity. Plenty of opportunity. I think we, we'd all agree. Just keen to get your closing thoughts, Ashab. You mentioned load factors and you know, no airline CEO is going to turn the nose up at a, a 90%, 95% load factor, especially in, in the lower season. Let's talk about yield, though, because it's one thing getting those bums on the seats, to put it bluntly, but if they're not paying the way, then the entire business model falls apart. A busy plane is only half the battle. You need to be getting that pricing right. Sure. Uh, and yeah, I mean, my second report that was launched just yesterday, I think one of the focus points was despite having the cost advantage that LCCs have, uh, unless for them to be successful on long haul networks, they will definitely need to add a premium cable. And that is going to have a massive impact on the yields per, for the airline because otherwise, uh, just covering operating expenses might not be enough because the kind of information that we have looked at and the data that we have looked at, we have largely covered operating expenses, but we all know that there are non-operating expenses as well that airlines have to cover. So absolutely, they have to make sure that uh, they have these premium cabins in place and they're able to extract and get the fair prices correct because otherwise, uh, it is only going to take them so long to be, not just become profitable and maybe they'll just wind up their operations because domestically it makes a lot of sense for them. But internationally and on long haul, yield is going to play a very big factor.
one final thought that i would still want to make uh, god sure, go still if we have just a few more minutes to squeeze this in which is uh, air, airport slots are very important uh, we talked about having slots at primary airports i mean operating out of secondary hubs might not be enough for you to stimulate enough demand so one of the examples that we looked at was jet blue's transatlantic affair transatlantic flights and one of the reasons why they were able to do so well because they're actually operating between lhr and jfk between boston logal to paris cbg between amsterdam schiphol to jfk and they've also recently announced flights to edinburgh and uh, dublin so one of their key strategies is operating out of primary hubs and making sure that they have uh, so it's not just on the aircraft side of things not just re- so just the demand part of that and making sure that you're able to stimulate the right demand from the right place is also very very important so what jetblue was able to do is incredible they've recently decided to slash many unprofitable routes but as we all know none of the transatlantic routes were impacted in fact they have decided to increase frequencies on their transatlantic flight which only goes to show uh, how much profit they are making on those flights and then having a uh, premium cabin having a decent loyalty program uh, we saw ryanair ceo making a point about southwest saying that it's no longer a true lcc it's no longer a true budget airline and to some extent it's also true and we can also say the same thing about jetblue as well so this evolving nature of the low cost business model is also very essential for any of the airline executive to make sure that the long haul prospect works and the jetblue was very smart they only had about 2% of their capacity on the long haul network so that that prudent cautious planning is very important if you just go full on into long haul it might be very risky but just having a established medium short haul network and then slowly and gradually planning your long haul network might be more prudent so those would be my final thoughts yes awesome final insights ashap thank you again for sharing those with us and our global audience if you want to learn more uh, about ashap's research uh, the challenges with low cost long haul and the opportunities with low cost long haul uh, visit research.skift.com much more information there uh, and uh, ashap will also be sharing an extract from his report in the next issue of airline weekly as we're recording wednesday that will be dropping on monday morning so keep an eye out for that for any subscribers among you my thanks again to Ashab for joining us. Uh, appreciate it. it's getting late where you are in India. Uh, so really appreciate your your insights and sticking around uh, to share those with us. Uh, wherever you are in the world, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll catch you next time on the Airline Weekly Lounge. Bye for now. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out airlineweekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.